This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043. The new Pretenders album is Relentless, which you can pre-order now. You can get all the info, thepretenders.com. Chrissy Hine joins us now. Chrissy, congratulations on this beautiful new album. Well, and I mean much. that sincerely. Oh, it's thanks. so good. Uh, and, you know, I I've always... expect you not to be sincere. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I've always had this thought about successful musical artists like yourself. Why would anyone want to retire when you have the best job in the world? Which leads me to the title of this album, you and the pretenders, I guess, are sort of relentless, right? I mean, what are well, you going to do, again, right? Well, again, I think you've already answered the question. I, I get asked a lot, you know, just by mates. They'll say, like, hey, why is Bob Dylan and why is Paul, Paul McCartney still, still doing it? Why are the Rolling Stones still doing it? Yeah. And I think this idea that you would make money and retire like an office worker, I mean, why? And, you know, my answer is we never had to do it. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um your voice is even better than ever before, if that's possible. In fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna embarrass you with this Johnny Greenwood quote. Um, I think about you daily is the song that he worked with you on. He says it was a genuine honor to score strings for Chrissy. The arrangement wrote itself because of that voice. She's one of the greatest singers in popular music, and her continuing passion for creation was an inspiring experience from the first email to the last note of the recording. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Johnny. <laughs> yeah. And he's amazing. Yeah, he's good and radio. He is of, amazing. I saw course. him, uh, you know, he did the... Uh, String arrangement for a Phantom Thread. Oh, right. And, okay. Uh, it's the Paul Thomas Anderson film. Oh. And I got to go uh, to see it with the whole orchestra actually yeah. playing. Oh to man. It. Yeah. So that was really cool. That is incredible. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and, he, and he came down to see us when we played uh, at a Pizza Express, a tiny basement club that usually has jazz bands and stuff. Oh, wow. uh, when we did that Val Bone Woe thing, we oh, did okay. a stripped down version and he was there. So, and we've been a fan of his from yeah, way back. So. Right. Yeah. This is the second Pretenders album. And correct me if I'm wrong here. You worked on uh, this with your guitarist, James Walburn, and you've been doing this sort of remote songwriting. Um, was that hard for you to get used to? Like, did you do it on Zoom? How did you guys do that? Yeah, no, I've only done one or two Zooms, um, so I'm not really haven't, haven't really got into that. We just did it over the phone. It started. Uh, well, we didn't do the Hate for Sale album that way because we could get together and yeah. sit down and bash some things out, and we had a, an idea of how we wanted that to be. Um, the ideal to make any album is if you can go out and play it before you've recorded it. But the way it works these days is, you've been on the road, you come off, you make an album. You record it, then you go out. Then after you're on tour for six months, you start, you know. You get uh, into a groove and a zone, Yeah, and the right? songs, you start thinking, wow, they wish we could record it now that we've... But anyway, it's gone kind of the other way around. Yeah. But what happened to James and I was during the lockdown, he sent me that um, Dylan song, um, Murder Most Foul. Okay, yeah. And I mean, I was really isolated it felt like being in a hotel room on a day off like times i don't know whatever it was yeah, 200 yeah. um and i didn't have a dog or anything and i was just sitting in there no outdoor space and i heard that song and that really jolted me so thank you bob dylan um as i think it did for many people um and as usual with uh, dylan it was poignant and sad and tragic but even then he still made Managed to make it funny and parts. Right, with a and, wink and a nod, yeah, perhaps. He yeah, he always has, uh, you know, all these elements. And so I said uh, to James, you know, I said, wow, let's, let's do some Dylan songs. And I'm not a Dylanologist as such. I know yeah. the songs I bought when I was a teenager, the albums I got. And certainly over the years, you know, we've all listened to him. But I went on line and could see which songs I weren't wasn't that familiar with but that I thought we could interpret and we just were doing them for fun and I would I'd send a it started where I sent you know just a my primitive guitar over the you know on, on my phone over to James and then he would embellish that send it back uh, and then I would listen to that on my cheap headphones which <laughs> I paid it cost I think seven quid at uh, Luton Airport years ago and I'd listen to his version on headphones on my computer so it wouldn't bleed into the phone and read the lyrics off an iPad uh -huh. and sing it into the phone and then send it back to him and he'd have the vocal. He'd 
add some more. And then as we went on, he started playing a lot more because I'm pretty rubbish and he's amazing. He's playing mandolin and, you know, all sorts on that. Uh, but it was done in such a um, simple way. I mean, yeah. these phones are amazing. As much as we loathe them with the vengeance right, for many reasons, yeah. they're also fantastic for... Uh, for many things and the sound quality is good then we send it to Chad Blake who I've worked with for years uh, who's like this sort of renowned genius of sound and he made it sound like an album and after that we thought wow that was easy and fun sure and think of all the time we've spent in studios trying to get a sound there right. were no drums on that album yeah well but, you have a couple of those i think you did videos for some of those dylan covers right well we did because chad uh has a family his wife um uh was a studio engineer that he met at real world studio and since they've moved out to the white you know chad's a california guy jackie's english and they moved out to wales way out in some remote place Got a couple horses, got a couple kids, dogs. Sounds nice to me, horses. It's fantastic. <laughs> They've really, he's really won the game of life, Chad. Yeah. Um, and so I knew that he's a great photographer and he sent me some pictures and I said, put something together for, for one of the songs. And uh, one of the sons was into filming and they started doing these, it turned into a whole project during lockdown where we'd send him a song, he'd mix it and then send back a whole video and they were pretty astonishing they're pretty actually. they're beautiful they're fantastic yeah really good then i got him to put a bunch of his photographs together into a book form because he's very modest chad um i even got him to put a picture of himself on the back of the book by tricking him <laughs> by suggesting him that he put that picture on the front cover which i knew he wouldn't do yeah and he said no 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 i i i don't want to be on the cover i said okay how about putting it on the back cover and he went okay nice kind of like tricking a kid into saying do you want right yeah do you want yeah. to go to bed now or do you want a story first right yeah exactly um, anyway so that whole episode during the lockdown kind of saved us from i can getting imagine too yeah. isolated and right and then after that um i knew i could send some like some lyrics to James and he could sit and that's how we did this last album. Yeah. He had some great melodic ideas and so it's changed a lot since I started where I just started alone with a guitar, which is probably where everyone from my generation started. Maybe it's a more efficient way of recording. Who knows? It's more efficient, but I think what you'll find with most things is the more facilities you have, sometimes uh, the less creative you become. Things you know, get in the way, maybe. Yeah. Kind of. I think most people, when they start and they're writing songs, they write them on a bus or they can't really play, but they just try to do what they can to, um, you know, get a, get the song together. Yeah. And then you meet people that have made a lot of money and they get their own studio and they have all these facilities. And yeah, I think it can get in the way. And we we have the extreme example of the Beatles going in to record an album in like uh, four hours or something. Oh, again, you know, they way knew how back. to play. Yeah, yeah. Led Zepp. Right. They went in their first, famously their first album, I think it was three days. But again, they'd been playing it on the road so they could just go in and bash it down. They yeah. knew what they were doing. That's what I was saying before. We now go on tour, get off, write the album, go in to record it, but we haven't, it's the other way around. Right, yeah. So your first album has always been, you've, it's kind of broken in on the road. But anyway, no one does it that way now because a lot of it is done by committee and there's a lot of songwriters and they don't meet each other and it's... Yeah, like 20, like, I don't I don't get that. I don't get the 20 well, songwriters. Well, it's a whole different thing. It's, it's a different world. music thing. It's a different yeah. world. Uh, Chrissy Hyde is with us. The new Pretenders album is Relentless. They are on tour now. You can get all the info about the pre-order the album and all the tour dates, thepretenders.com. A uh, couple songs I want to talk about really quick here. Let the Sun Come In, the first song I've been playing on this show, and you're talking about your guitar player and your sort of co-writer, uh, James, and the riff on that song it's amazing. literally like stuck in my head the first time I heard it. It was like a classic Pretender song, like, I that that riff is never going away in my yeah, head. It's great. Yeah, and that's what it's about is riffs. And yeah. Uh, yeah, he he's a real riff master, and so is James Honeyman Scott, Jimmy Scott. Well, yeah, my original guitar player, which yeah. is all the guitar players have had since Jimmy died have not only been paying tribute to him, but were inspired by him. So you know they they've it, their songwriting credit Johnny Marr, uh, yeah. Adam Seymour, Robbie McIntosh. 
Yeah. Um, Billy Bremner, actually, Jimmy was inspired by Billy Bremner. So when D- Jimmy died, we got Billy in straight away because we knew that that's where Jimmy's roots were coming from. It's hard to be one of those riff guys, too, because there aren't many of them. You know what I mean? There's a lot of lead guitar players. There's a lot of rhythm guitar players. There aren't many riff guys. Right. And that's you know? really the, the the essence of a rock song. For, for my money, that's yeah. what it's all about, is the guitar and the riff. Yeah, like Elliot Easton of the Cars. Like, perfect solo, perfect riff. Not too much, not too little, just the right amount. Chrissy Hyde is with us, uh, so we're talking about that song, Let the Sun Come In. I Love a Love. That's another one on the new that's album. That's the most I pretenders, love. classic pretenders sounding for some reason. And we didn't intend that. Actually, when we were writing the songs we had in mind something that was much slower and moodier and more probably on the back of that foul blown woe thing which i would say was a jazz dub kind of a thing um but inevitably as we got in and kept playing them they just got more and more rocked up and when we were doing a love that's a, a an interesting uh song the way that evolved because we went in, me and David Wrench, the producer, and James went in and listened to it. We were all kind of scratching our head. We had different people playing on the album as we went along. A couple of bass players we knew and some Carwin Ellis keyboards that we worked with. And But as we sort of distilled the thing and boiled it down, and we, as like I said, it inevitably seemed to get more rock and roll. Mm. Uh, we rocked it up. Uh, it just seems inevitable. And we were listening to that and... No one can figure out what what it was in that song that wasn't making the grade. And James can play anything, and I love his piano, his keyboard playing especially. Yeah. Um, but on that one, I said, go in and get the growler. There's this uh, bass that has a real growly sound to it. Yeah. I said, you play the bass, replace the bass. So he went in and did it with the plectrum and really got a very, you know, uh, Lemmy sound. I said, think Ooh, Lemmy. Always okay. think Lemmy. Yes. And then we listened to that. And I said, okay, go do it again. <laughs> so it's actually double. He's doubled the bass on mm. the growler. And that's what gives that song a kind of, I mean, you're, you're not going to notice it when you're listening to it. Well, yeah. You're not, but you will now that I've said it. Well, of course. So yeah. it has a kind of, um, uh, it still has a kind of rock element to it, even though it's a mid-tempo, yeah, right. breezy song. Um, would you say there's a theme for the whole album with these songs or no? There might Lyrically, be because they were written around the same time. Yeah. And, uh, so, I mean, certainly losing my sense of taste, you can, you know where that's coming from. Oh boy. Yeah. Um, which I never lost mine, but that was, uh, uh what the song's referring to, I guess. And, um, I don't know that there's a, a theme as such there. I'm not, it, m- Personally, when I write songs, I'm not really a storyteller. I don't make songs up. They usually are um, autobiographical. I hate saying that, and I don't like talking about them, but I can only call from my own experience. Yeah, I don't yeah. make up a scenario where I'm you know, driving down the motorway <laughs> or going through the desert in an old car, yeah, you know, yeah. unless I've actually done that. Well, that, that's the beauty of your songs and a lot of songwriters. They can mean something different to everybody. You know what I mean? That's really the essence of a song is everyone can interpret it for them. But you can't go into it thinking that way. No, no. You just hope it, you know, works out and someone can relate to it. Um, uh, You're on tour in the States now doing regular pretender shows, but also along with doing those some Guns N' Roses dates, too. Uh, You just played with them at MetLife Stadium, which is literally like right across the river here uh, from New York City. Uh, Tell me about playing with those guys. You've probably known them forever. Um, and I haven't just, known you know, them forever. I've, I, we did something with them a few years ago at a festival. And um, the truth is, I'm t- 10, 15 years older than those guys. So by the time they were making their first album, which I think was Appetite for Destruction. 90 something, 89. Yeah, I was 90. out on the road. Yeah, so, yeah. And I think the experience with uh, most people in bands is you're influenced by who you're listening to when you're 15. Yes. From the age of 13 through your teens. And then you get in your band, and you, those were your influences. Uh, I think that just kind of is... I mean, if I was working in a shoe store now, I'd probably be much more aware of everything that's going on around me. But once you're out in the road, uh, you know, and your influences are in your music. Yeah, totally. So when Guns N' Roses came out, I was already 
I had a similar thing with um, ZZ Top, who I hadn't paid that much attention to, because when they were on MTV, I was already on the road. Then we did a tour with ZZ Top, and I thought, ah, I better go check these guys out. And I went out to the sound desk, smoked a joint, and I went out every single night on that tour and watched them. I was just blown away by them. I mean, first of all, what a great band, and Billy Gibbons is such a great singer. Um, and a, a sweetheart, too. Yeah, Absolute they're just, sweetheart. Yeah. And yeah. I think I was waylaid by MTV, where I saw the girls and the hot rods, and I just didn't pay much attention. Right, yeah, because yeah. Because the, the, I think the format of how we got music changed, once it was on MTV, I lost interest, because I, the visuals distract from me from yeah, the music. Yeah, it kind of locks in a thing in your brain, yeah. and, you know, whereas we used to just hear it on the radio. Exactly. You know I mean? I'm a radio person, which yeah. is why I'm here today. You know, I love radio. <laughs> radio, to me, is where it's at, um, or certainly where I'm coming from. So, back to Guns N' Roses. Um, we were offered some Guns N' Roses tour, uh, tours, you know, some shows, and we'd done that once, so I said, yeah, let's let's do it. And the, the vehicle for it why I wanted to do them is because I really, after the lockdown, I was talking to James and I said, let's just do what we want to do for now on. Because we've done a lot of big supports um, to keep ourselves on the road. Right. But yeah. when you do a support, it's not really your audience. So you're trying to do something that the audience will at least know you for, which will be stuff they've heard on the radio, not the what they call now deep cuts, the album tracks. Oh, yeah. uh, so, you know, we did Stevie Nicks, which was great. Again, greatest hits package. We did Phil Collins in South America. Again, had wow. to play a greatest hits package for the audience. Yeah. Um, and then the lockdown came and everyone started selling their publishing. And I, I don't really know too much about it because I'm not, I don't get into the finances. Uh, right. Probably more than anyone I've ever met in this business. Why do you think they do that? Do you think they're like, okay, I'm 80 years old. I have kids. You know, what's going to, they don't, I don't want them to have the responsibility of dealing with it. Yeah. Like, why do you think they do that? I guess that's why I, I did it. Cause my manager said, look, do you want to sell your publishing? And I said, yeah, okay. Whatever right. you think. That's yeah. why I did it. Oh, okay. I said, you know, you're my manager. What, what do you think? And he went, yeah, I do it. So I said, okay, let's do it. So that gave me a little bit to, coast on but I don't really know how publishing works you get some money every time it's played and someone collects it and then you get Stream a check and you know all that something use and, like yeah, that yeah. but again the way I am with my money is I'll just spend it and if I get a phone call and someone says you better stop spending then I'd be like okay <laughs> I, I don't <laughs> pursue it beyond that yeah yeah um so when Ian, my manager, said yes so it, so that that gave me a little bit of freedom right to think you know what when I was talking to James guitar player I said yeah let's just do what we want well I want to play clubs now the truth about clubs is they're a money loser mm -hmm. unless you hump all your gear put it in a van load in and load out yourself Old school, no yeah. no backline no sound guy no monitors nothing then you can play clubs but like who wants to do that if you don't have to right you know if you can stay in a hotel and take a train yeah which is what we do so I said no let's just play the clubs but they lose money on that level um, I'm only explaining that because even my, my friends I've had to explain it to because they don't really know how the business works. Yeah, yeah. But if you have any kind of crew, you're paying wages, hotels, or you want it's to expensive. say halfway, yeah. it's impossible. Yeah, yeah. And most people, you'd be shocked at how much a lot of support bands, you wouldn't because you'll know, but get for touring, they might get like, you know, maybe $200. Mm -hmm. Not even enough to... Per DM and then the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. So they're unless they have some record company support and all that's changed. Anyway, I said, let's do clubs. I want to do clubs. And we couldn't get any. And I kept calling my office saying, yeah, we, I've got to play. Let's get some clubs. And then I said, you know what? After a few months and we couldn't get any, I said, uh, you know what? I'm going to do some clubs for free. And the next day, my manager got back and goes, oh, actually, the agents found some clubs for you. Oh, funny. And then... He admitted, he's great, my, my manager. A couple of weeks later, he goes, maybe I over-strategized mm. waiting for an album. And then, because most people are going to try to play and, you know, get bigger as they go along, not right, get yeah. smaller. But I don't want to get bigger. I want to get smaller. So, and a manager isn't there to tell you to lose money. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I said to him once, I said, you know, Ian, I don't care if I break even. And he said, hmm. He goes, yeah, but if you break even, I can't pay my staff. Yeah. And I said, eh, of course. Right. So, 
Guns N' Roses. Yes. So Guns N' Roses come along, and I thought, okay, well, that'll pay for the clubs because we're lo losing money doing what I want to do. Yeah. And I went out with Guns N' Roses, and after the first day, I just fell in love with them. Yeah. I mean, they're just fantastic. The crew, the band, everyone's really cool. Uh, cool, that's a good word, because I... Johnny Marr and I have decided that cool is dead. Nothing's cool anymore. Um, but the guys in Guns, Guns N' Roses are towing the line on cool, I think. Yeah. And they're so lovely in the band. They play great. Slash is the best. He's they're fantastic. The, yeah. They're just great. And, you know, they're, they're uh, you know, Axel is, I believe, the only man that could probably uh, put Donald Trump out of the running. Because I think if, if if he started running for president, everyone would switch over immediately. I saw the He's funniest. just, people love him. He, and I sat at the side of the stage watching that band, and I've seen grown men in tears. Oh, yeah. Because they never thought they'd see him again. Yeah, you know and what they I mean? just, they love them. And um, uh, so anyway, that's turned out to be a story with a happy ending, because they're, they're paying for our clubs, plus we get to see them. Right, yeah. In front of a huge audience, in front of stadiums, which is incredible. Yeah, although the heat's been a problem, and I, I don't oh, see this been, lasting yeah, it's next been a year. Brutal summer. Yeah. We won't see this next year because it's. I even had to cut my set short in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, because really? it was 100 degrees. It was 100 oh degrees in yeah, Rome. Yeah, Europe had a heat wave. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was and, I going to talk? Uh, oh, Chicago. I couldn't leave my room on the day off. It was too hot. You mentioned, um, I, I don't like to talk about them, but when the mug shots came out last week, some absolute genius, you know, Bohemian Rhapsody Queen with the four of them singing yeah. in the video, he made a video of all the mug. I'm going to show it to you after this interview. Who is this? This guy on TikTok made a video of the mug shots singing Queen. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, Bohemian. I don't go into that political thing either. Oh my God. Yeah. So funny. I but, mean, I'm, I'm uh, but people, right outside of all that. All I know is looking at that audience and looking at Axl Rose. I oh, thought, yeah. th this is the guy yeah. right there. Absolutely. That's the guy who could help us. Your uh, memoir, Reckless, came out in 2015. And then three years later, you published a book of some of your paintings called Adding the Blue. Were you always painting in your life? No, or? I mean, that was kind of a mistake that that, well, not a mistake. It was a happy... Uh, happy accident? Or? Well, uh, some people, it's it's a couple named um, uh, their brother and sister uh, Catherine and Nick Roylance and their father had this company called Genesis Books in the 60s and did sort of rock star books and stuff and then they carried on doing it and they heard I'd been doing some paintings so uh, and that's what I thought I'd do in the beginning then I got waylaid by rock and roll mm. um, but then when I had a bit of time and I started painting again just you know it's a I don't know what you'd call I wouldn't call it a hobby I mean, I really get into it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, they heard about that, and they said, can we do a book of some of your paintings? And I went, well, I don't know. I'd never thought about it. So I sent them some snaps I had on my phone. Then I went on tour and forgot all about it. But when I came back, there was this prototype of a coffee table book they put Ooh, together. Okay. And it was so beautifully done, I, I was pretty shocked. Yeah. And I called them. I said, you guys can do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, So nice. they put that book together. And that was me sort of finding my feet a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I can't draw a stick figure. I don't know how you people do it, but it's, you know, God bless you. You've got another sort of outlet, another creative outlet. Well, it outlet, is, and you know? it's fun. It's like a meditation. I don't know how people write novels. Because, yeah. you know, writing your own story, that's not really writing. I mean, you know, I've, actually, I didn't have a ghostwriter, as many people for some reason do, and they don't mention the ghostwriter, which I kind of think is plagiarism. I think the ghostwriter's name should be on the front of the of book. Of course, absolutely. Because sitting down in front of a keyboard or a typewriter or whatever you use, a pen, yeah. and trying to figure out how to assemble it and put it together, that's the hard part. I mean, this probably happens to you on a daily basis, Chrissy, but do people come up to say, hey, Chris, remember we went to this, and then you did that, and then we did this, and I'm... Yeah, it does happen I a mean, lot. You know, and it's like, if I was ever going to do a book, I would have to interview all of my friends to tell me what I did, all the stuff that I can't remember, which it seems to be a lot. <laughs> yeah, oh, tell me about it. I get that constantly with yeah. stuff that I really should remember. Because, right. you know, there'll be characters involved in these scenarios that people right. remind me of that, um, you know, I'm horrified that I don't remember. <laughs> hey, remember when you and me and Bob Dylan did this? And I'm like, no. No, please like, tell me. Yeah, yeah um, right. But for, when I wrote the book, I just used it for my own memory. So right. I got it a little bit. And I left out um, 
anything that I thought might hurt people's feelings. Or, yeah. You know, I didn't try to say, you know, not go to the dark side. Then I read Mark Lanigan's autobiography, Ooh, right? Uh, Sing backwards and weep. And he pulled no punches, and that's maybe the greatest rock bio- autobiography ever written. I gotta read that. That's then. incredible. Yeah, I'm I'm a voracious uh, memoir guy, so. Okay, I haven't read that many, but that one's that's the one, Mark Lanigan. Um, you know, you were talking about Johnny Johnny Marr. Uh, I had him on the show a few years back. He told me this great story where you invited him to lunch. Uh, I think this was in L.A. He got to your place, and you said, "Wait, someone else is coming to lunch." Uh, so you hang around, you you know, doorbell rings, and in walks Bruce Springsteen. What a fantastic story. Yeah, I don't remember that. You don't remember that? No. <laughs> Did Johnny ever tell you that he told that story? I think he told I, that I, story in his book. I think uh, I have heard that he said that somewhere on a podcast or something, and I was, you know, deeply embarrassed that I don't remember. Sorry, guys. Pretty awesome story, though, still. Um, talk about performing at the Taylor Hawkins tribute. Um, tell me about that. I, I saw a video, Dave Grohl playing bass on some Pretenders classics and performing Oh Darling with Sir Paul McCartney, a song that he had never performed live ever. And you did it with him. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm as surprised as you are. <clears throat> Taylor. Now, Taylor, um, a girl, uh, named Barbara Krusik, who I had, um, done something with when I was in LA I uh, there was a little there was a there's a museum in downtown LA called the Broad Museum and we were asked to open it James and I were going to do an acoustic set and then he got waylaid with something and I met this uh, guy at a killer's show where Mm. Brandon Flowers asked me to do something and this guitar player walked up to me in catering and said can I ask you something I was like oh okay here we go and he said, can I ask you about James Honeyman Scott? And I knew immediately that this guitar player was everything that I like in a guitar player, just because that's who he mentioned. And it was Benji Lassat, who I've ended up working with since. Oh, okay. Who's a fantastic guitar player. And he was working with Brandon. Um, anyway, we I ended up opening the Broad Museum with Benji, and I got him to put a band together. And this girl, Barbara, was playing drums. And she wrote to me a couple years later and said, can I give one of the Foo Fighters your email? And I went, yeah. And the next thing I know, Taylor Hawkins calls me. Wow. And he started calling me every day. And we spoke on the phone for hundreds of hours. And I, I found out after he died that, you know, he spoke to a lot of people for hundreds of hours. And he was just a gregarious music fan. And what we'd talk about was John Lennon and this. And we talked about music endlessly on the phone. Um, and then he died, and I never met him. Oh. I sang on his album. That's why he got in touch with me, to sing on his album, again, remotely. And then I heard he died. And I went and I met, when I met Dave Grohl, I said, you know, I never met Taylor. And he went, what? Yeah. Because we talked so much. He, we, I felt like Taylor was one of my best friends. Um, so that's how that came about. But he, yeah, he, and I hear that from so many people, the story you just tell about him. He was such a huge music. He wanted to hear everything yep. about everyone yep. all day long and all night and long. And he would call me, he'd be like, hey, Chrissy, I'm on my dirt bike. I'm going up, you know. He was always like doing something, but always listening to music, always talking about bands. And, uh, you know, I tried to talk him out of bands he liked, and he tried to talk me out of. <laughs> that's, um, that's so fun. That's oh, so great. fun. He was so lovely. Um, so that's why. So you got the call happened. to do the uh, and Taylor I, tribute. And Dave Grohl, I was must say, I was pretty blown away by him because he was playing for eight hours every day during the rehearsals. He played with everyone. He plays everything. You know, he's from Ohio. He's a Buckeye. Yeah, yeah. And he's, uh, you know, just another mad <laughs> lunatic who yeah. can play anything. And um, then when I played with Johnny Marr. Johnny jumped on stage in Glastonbury. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. This summer. And Dave got right? Yeah. Yeah. And we were we were in the studio getting ready for that. And Dave Grohl sends me a text and he goes, yeah, hey, I'm in town. And I went, oh, great. And I put the phone down. I said, hey, guys, that was Dave Grohl. And he, they said, do you think he wants to jump on stage and play with us? Because they're playing at Glastonbury. And I went, oh, gosh, I should have thought Ooh, of that. Good idea. So I wrote back and he said, F, yes. <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> We said, okay, well, come on down to the studio. Well, he didn't. He says, I'm taking my girls to the market in Camden mm. Town, where we were rehearsing. 
And he just jumped on stage. We'd never played with him before. He'd never played drums on that song. He goes, I know it by heart. Wow. So he's great. Just, uh, yeah. He's the best. He, he, he's amazing. Um, the last thing I want to ask you about was Sinead O'Connor. I loved what you wrote about her uh, when she passed. Tell us, tell us more of your thoughts about Sinead. Sinead, I did uh, work with um, when I put I put together a concert for Linda McCartney when she died, because uh, she'd become a dear friend, and I thought, what can we do for Linda, just to show the world that she had her own life. Because I spoke to her once and I said, hey, let's do some animal rights stuff. This is Linda. Yeah. And she goes, oh, no one wants to hear what I have to say. They just want me, you know, standing next to Paul when he gets an award. And I thought, that's so not true. You know, Linda had her own friends and um, she, you know, people loved her. Um, And I think, let's face it, you've got to feel a little diminished to be standing next to a beetle because that's who the bright lights are on all the time. Right. But Linda was so lovely and and. All our conversations always went back to meat eating and vegetarianism and um, animal rights. So I spent a year putting this together and we were going to give all the proceeds to Carla Lane, who was a friend of Linda's who had a, she's a writer in England. She had an animal sanctuary and Sinead immediately said yes. Oh man, so great. And um, she, my memory of Sinead was just, she, just, she was a riot. She was just really good fun. Yeah. Um, uh, but she certainly... Anything that was written in the press or anything that was at all derogatory or anything that she didn't like, she got really, you know, upset about. And I said to her, hey, just don't look at it. Don't, don't read it. I don't. I never read anything. Yeah, yeah. And I said, yeah, well, but, but for some reason she couldn't not do that. So she got, um, you know, she'd call up editors. Right, yeah. And get, and I said, St- stop reading it. It's just winding you up. Don't do don't that. Don't engage, yeah. She couldn't do it. yeah. Um, even that show, the Dylan show, where she ripped, you know, that was days after she ripped up the picture of the picture Pope. Of the Pope She's yeah. been vindicated now because people kind of get it with the problems that Hello. have been I mean, exposed. Yeah. yeah. Um, but even that, when I was standing at the side of the stage, I could hear a lot of people were cheering for her because she's Sinead O'Connor. You know, yeah. people love her. I mean, you know, I mean, what, unbelievable voice. Unbelievable. At the end of the day. I mean, just amazing voice. Yeah. Fantastic. And, um... Yeah, and she, uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, actually, she had a hard time, and she right. was, um, similarly uh, to when Jeff Beck died recently, oh. my first thought was, oh, he got out on a high, and I felt a relief for Sinead, and, you know, maybe that's wrong of me, maybe I should have burst into tears, um, but actually, in Jeff's case, I thought he was out playing, he had Johnny Johnny Depp on the road, who he loved. Who yeah. He met recently. Right. And Johnny got him. Did a record together. Playing, yeah, yeah. Playing rock and roll again, which I loved. And um, Jeff was happy. Uh, he has a beautiful wife. Bill, you know, still working on his hot rods. Right. Was playing at the height of his game, having a good time. And I thought, good for you. And actually, I went to the funeral. And two of the pallbearers were Jimmy Page and Eric Clapton. Wow. And they both spoke at the funeral, and both of them said similar things because mm. they all grew up together. Right. And they both said Jeff was always ahead of us, and I thought, well, I don't know if you see the irony in the situation we're at here. Right. Yeah. But you know, and I was glad for Jeff. Right. That he, top of his, you know, right at the height, where he was playing, he was in great form, having a good time. Well, Sinead, I don't know if she was. I read later that she was working on an album and mm. had been. Uh, enthusiastic, right? But she certainly had some hard knocks, and had been depressed. Yeah. So, um, you know, I hadn't seen her for years. Right. But I thought I did feel a sense of relief for her. Yeah. But I sure would have liked to have heard what she was working on. Me and maybe too. That will come out if she made an album. Hopefully. Chrissy Hind is with us. The new album from The Pretenders is Relentless. The band is on tour now. You can get all the info about the new album and the tour dates, thepretenders.com. When you think about it, the cool is dead. Yeah, there's got to be a better word, right? I mean... No, think about it, though. What's cool? Yeah. Think of a new car that's made that's cool. Yeah. You can't. No. What is cool? Cool is... To me, is like vintage and old and classic. That's, that's what I mean. Nothing now is cool. Yeah, it's dead. It's like remember they used to say God is dead. Now cool is dead. 
Well, you know, and you can relate to this. You know, as a kid, <clears throat> there weren't videos. There wasn't YouTube. There wasn't MTV. There wasn't anything else like that. When you heard a song on the radio and you're like, fuck, who is that? Maybe, maybe you'd go to a, a deli or a drugstore and you'd see a magazine. Oh, that's what they look. I know. And the love affair was amazing. I remember exactly where I was when I saw the first Beatles single. I was in a discount house where my parents did their grocery shopping called Clarkins. And they'd be doing their grocery shopping and they had a little tiny record department. And I flipped through and saw that Beatles. I can remember where I was standing when I saw the first Jimi Hendrix album. I remember where I was sitting when I saw the Janis Joplin Big Brother album. You know, they made it more than an impact. They informed our entire destiny. Oh, completely, yeah. And But now everything is super, like, pushed on us, on your phone, on your television, wherever yeah, you go. It's before just... Before you had, you were on a mission to seek it out. You heard right. something and you were on a mission to find it. Right. And you would find it. And no one else in your school did. Yeah. But you would. And there might be a few people that you could talk to about it. You need yeah, to, now you're kind of batting it off. You need to write an article, The Death of Cool. Let's bring it back. <laughs> Let's bring Johnny and I are determined to bring it back. But you Johnny, know, it's a, I want to see his his guitar book is coming out, right? That's right, yeah. yeah like, I've reunited with him recently, and then we did the, and that's been a blast, because you know he can talk. Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. So, he can definitely you know, talk. Us, uh, together, that's just... He talks with his guitar, like, and he's a riff guy. He yeah. is the king of riffs. I mean, oh, my God, so good. Yeah, so and good. very influenced by James Jimmy Scott. When yeah. I met him, that's who... So, in Jimmy Scott, which is really the reason I wrote my book, was to say, hey, the world, James Honeyman Scott, because in those lists of great guitar heroes, I don't see him, and that I'm crushed. Yeah, yeah. Because he influenced so many people. But we were very... We were cool. We played it down when he died. We didn't seek publicity or go crying yeah. to the press about right, it. Right, yeah. Yeah, he he is one of those riff... James was one of those riff guys, you know, and then I think of, of the others, and I think of... You know, the edge, he uses a lot of effects, but he's still a riff guy, riff guy at the beginning of the day. Uh -huh. you know, obviously, Keith Richards and, you know, the list goes not on and on, but there's a there's a select few that are just, you know, like your guitar player. That riff on the new song is just, you know, yeah. sticks in my brain. Amazing. I know, me too. I, I've, he's the best. Yeah. But, you know, there's a few of them out there. Yeah. Actually, I'm was very surprised to hear that guitar sales are up during the pandemic people were buying guitars yeah, girls buying were guitars. buying guitars yeah. Well, yeah girls could always buy guitars yeah there's this myth that girls weren't encouraged mm. guess what girls no one was encouraged mm. you can you see... know if you want to do it do it this is the reason we weren't encouraged is why we got in rock bands to be honest there are all these girls on TikTok with guitars and drums, and they're playing to our favorite music. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. And they're getting all these followers, obviously, be, be, but they're fucking good. They're really yeah. good. You know, it's fantastic to see, you know? Yeah, I mean, I'm not partial to gender. I don't really yeah, yeah. feature that. But, right. you know, if anyone's good, they're good. Right, exactly. And to, I'm more thrilled if a teenager boy comes up to me and says i got a telecaster because i thought it yeah. was i mean i'm i i'm not a great guitar player i get by what i do what your, i have to do what was the one you had a white was it a white telly pretty no, much i still have it you still have it the one that was in a lot of the videos i yeah. think right yeah yeah is that uh what year is that i don't know oh, okay older than me i think <laughs> i don't know what no 60s or something I don't yeah know. guitars are to me are like um modern american art they're like a 63 Corvette or a Mustang, you know what I mean? Or a 68 I, Corvette. Or 68, and I just want to put them on the wall and look at them. Yeah, they are great. They are great. You know Mike Campbell of the, of the Heartbreakers? Uh-huh. He, I interviewed him for his latest solo, solo thing, and he has in his house, uh, we were talking about rock and roll extravagance and things that people buy and things like that. He goes... You ever go to a Chinese laundry and, you know, you get your dry cleaning and they press a button and the the dry cleaning comes around on a belt? He's like, I have one of those in my house and it's filled with guitars. Amazing. <laughs> you got to yeah. put that on Instagram. We just <laughs> did um, Jack White's Club, which holds 300 people. So that was... Oh, in Nashville? Yeah. Oh. We were there Third yesterday. Man. Third Man. Yeah. yeah. 
Wow. Yeah, we, we flew in. We came in yesterday. We played there the night before. And uh, I called it Boy Heaven. Oh, my God, yeah. Because the whole place is... Man and, cave heaven, right? Yeah. yeah. And just uh, boy heaven. Yeah. I don't even know if it's, you know, it's very adolescent, the taste <laughs> in, which is what we love about rock and roll. Yeah. It keeps, we're always adolescent when we're listening to it. That's what I love about Guns N' Roses. Yeah. Is they really appeal to the 15-year-old. Right. Uh, it's kind of obnoxious. You're yeah. not really supposed to say that. Like, right. Like, you know, turn that down. Did they you, appeal to all the things that we're told not to do when we're 15. At Third Man, did you, did you record it or no? Because they no, have like I a lathe in the back, right? They, you yes, can actually they make a vinyl. Us, they said we hadn't got in touch with them in time. Oh, okay. Yeah. You got to set that up, right? Yeah. But, um, and then just down the road, it's Dan Arbuck's studio. Oh, yeah. And his studio is also like, you know, a vintage, a, a, a cave of vintage gear. Yeah. I recorded an album with him alone. He, I'm playing a new song from him. Um, he just got a, he's released a compilation called 21st Century Juke Joint Blues. Chrissy, always a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. This is Out of the Box with your host, Jonathan Clark. Out of the Box, Sunday nights at 9 on Q1043.